Okay, welcome all of you to our Horizon Europe Open Science Requirements in Practice webinar that we're delivering today. As you can see, we are all here, our big team. So thank you so, so much for attending and to give us your valuable time. Um, so let's have some house notes first, just for all of us to be aligned in participation. Here we are. So of course we have to let you know that our session will be recorded and our Q&A session will be recorded, but not disseminated. And after its presentation, you all of course have, uh, you know, the valuable time to share your thoughts and for all of us to coordinate the Q&A session. Please keep in mind to keep your microphones and cameras off during our presentations and make sure that you have added your name and affiliation and briefly introduce yourself in the chat option. Finally, feel free to unmute and turn your cameras on uh, when we are going to join our Q&A discussion. And of course, feel free to ask. We are going to cover all your thoughts and questions. So let's go on and have uh, a short overview of our today's outline and the agenda of insightful topics. Perfect, so we are going to share some important documents, of course, that you need to know. And please keep in mind that all slides and this recording will be uploaded in Zenodo afterwards and our YouTube channel, open air YouTube channel in order for all of us to uh, you know, go back and check in case you would like to uh, practice or uh, again read some uh, announcements. Uh, Open Science and Horizon Europe grant proposal will be also an essential topic provided with from our speakers. Open access and publication requirements will be also uh, in your behalf in order to have some essential uh, highlights there diving into open data, of course, other recommended open science practices, tools that facilitate your open science practices. Uh, we'll give you uh, some sort of insights of how to report research results and some final tips that will be our outline and agenda. And of course, let's welcome and uh, have an overview of our exceptional speakers today. These are the provided documents and special links. And of course, we are welcome our highly regarded CEO of Open Air, Natalia Manola, our specialist Lars von Nielsen, Zenodo creator, and of course, our exceptional expert, Maya Dolinar, uh, having to do with user engagement and is called EOS Clearzone. So I'm passing the floor to Natalia Manola in order to start presenting Horizon Europe grant proposals. Thank you all. Okay. Hello. Uh, uh, I have to say that this is the first time I'm giving the webinar on behalf of Jonathan. So I would like, you know, I would like you to be very, you know, lenient on what I may say. Uh, but uh, having written many proposals in the past, I think, you know, if you have questions, uh, I will be able to respond to them. So when we're writing Horizon Europe proposal, and you know, the mandate of Horizon Europe is, uh, you know, uh, in very often uh, we, we nail down to research outputs, but the more open we are in uh, hor in uh, in uh, writing horizon european proposals it's the better so when we talk about openness uh, we talk about openness transparency accountability all of these things that come with open open science so we talk about open access to publications we talk about responsible management of data, so fair principles. It may be open, it may be closed, but at least it must be curated. Uh, we try to give you know, access to data uh, as open as possible, as close as necessary. That means is that if we have privacy issues we're not sure about, 
or if we have uh, collaborations with uh, SMEs or industry that uh, may, lean, uh, may lead to some competitiveness uh, issues, this is something you know, that we need to consider. And then what we need to also um, consider about open science is information about outputs, tools, instruments to validate and reuse results and data. So think about when it's a data-driven project, everything that comes um, that intervenes in this process and then of course uh, we need to think about what digital or physical um, access to results to validate and conclusion so think about what kind of infrastructures that we will be using in order to make sure that um, uh, that uh, things are being accessed uh, next slide so just to give you the, the overall context now, uh, we have open science parts when writing a proposal. We have a part A and part B that you all know. On the application form, uh, we are required to list five publications, widely used data sets, software, goods, facility services, or other achievements relevant to the call. I think uh, try to see, um, uh, we're not sure how the reviewers uh, go over this, uh, if they actually click on them or if they actually look at it, uh, at, uh, at uh, the contents of them. But the more open these uh, these five elements are, the best is, uh, the better is to prove to the reviewers that uh, we're doing a, a good work in, um, in uh, practicing open science. Then there are uh, a few parts in part B in the project proposal in the technical description. So under the excellence, there is a dedicated thing about in the methodology about open science, RDM management and other research outputs. There is um, a thing that we could, uh, a section that we could um, uh, consider uh, on dissemination, exploitation and communication. So there we need to think about the stakeholders and how the results, not just the publications, but the, the overall results of the project reach out or reaching out to um, uh, stakeholders like policymakers, citizens, public uh, industry. And th this is where you can link uh, with the open science and how you're practicing open science. And then, of course, under the quality and efficiency of the implementation in the work plan, you need to be, uh, we need to be very specific on how we will be implementing, uh, especially data management. And uh, last but not least is that if you have a, a partner that has proven excellence in open science or in research data management or you know, in software uh, data management, software management, that would be also a good, uh, a good, uh, good asset. So, Overall, when we're writing the proposals, uh, we try to see, you know, because it's about, you know, let's be honest, the uh, proposals is about excellence, it's about results, it's about uh, collaboration, it's about all of these things. Open science is just a vehicle and it's just a channel to, to, to do these things. So that that uh, our, our advice to you is that it has to be to the point, but it has to be um, uh, obvious in these different parts. Uh, next slide. Oops, okay. Now, on the publications, what can we do on the publications uh, when we're writing the proposal? Is that uh, uh, what, what the Horizon uh, Europe uh, mandate is, is that we have open access to publications and we have open, immediate open access, okay? So that means is that we need to have this, you know, we need to think about um, uh, where we published conferences, journals, uh, uh, but uh, what is important here is to see is that uh, we need to see trusted repositories. So it's not just dumping them on some website that is, is openly available, but it has to be, you know, through the rules, uh, repositories, uh, open access journals, even closed journals, but at least they are in the repositories. And uh, what we need to think about, we don't need to write up, you know, to write about it, but uh, the, 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 the latest trends are in uh, publications that you know they have merit by themselves and not um, uh, necessarily 
uh, have merit because of the impact factor. Uh, we know that there is a trade-off. So, you know, this is uh, something that the community that is writing this, uh, this proposal uh, knows much better than what we do. But think about, you know, that there are different tiers and kinds and types of publications where you, uh, where, where we need to publish. So uh, all you have to do when you're writing the proposal is to provide, you know, very clear, uh, it's not just insights, but very clear directions of how you plan to have immediate open access. And immediate open access, uh, we will go, uh, we will go um, uh, when, when, uh, in the subsequent uh, um, slides, uh, but this is this is the key thing here. Next slide. Natalia, you should be able to control the slides. Would you like to try? Ah, so how do I do that? From from Zoom? Yes. I don't see any. I don't see any um, ah, okay. buttons. Maybe if you give me, you know, if, if I have host uh, um, option. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think I think we skipped one slide. We skipped. Okay, but research data. Okay, so publication now research data. Okay, so on research data. Uh, what, as we said, is as close as uh, as open uh, as close as possible as open uh, no as as open as possible as close as necessary. So you need to think in advance if you you know if you will open your data and this is uh, something in part A. But no matter what, if you open or not open the data, the data needs to be um, deposited and well curated and put in a repository ready to be shared at any point somebody is asking you know it doesn't have to be open to everyone but at least you know somebody you know given the permission they are um, able to to uh, to have access to it so this is where the fair principles come in place uh, at uh, at uh, writing time an official dmp is not required the submission stage but when they are asking you all of this uh, uh, in the excellence in 1.2 about open science and about research data management we need to have you know half a page a page because you know we are at maximum uh, about how we plan to do it so it's uh, it's very crucial to say there what data or we think you know you think that you will be using your project will be using what are the ethical considerations of this data and what are the access um, capabilities of this data that you will be reusing then your project uh, presumably will be creating data so um, you need to say uh, you need to have you know maybe in bullet points maybe but but something that shows that you know you have a very good idea of the data that you will be producing. So type and say of data, metadata standards, because these are uh, key for interoperability, uh, how you will use persistent identifiers, how you will be using licenses. Uh, and all of this could be, you know, could be very well um, uh, summarized under the use that uh, your project will be used very well established repositories because repositories now and, and also um, Lars, uh, our colleague from, Zin from, from CERN uh, can elaborate on that is, is by having, you know, uh, by, by, by uh, showing uh, that you know of the infrastructure and the services and that these repositories uh, provide fair by design is a very good uh, thing uh, uh, to showcase. Also, what is uh, very important to, to, to say here is how much effort you're going to be um, and if you will be spending effort on curation because quality data quality data is important who will be responsible you know do you have a partner that will be responsible is it going to be a joint and collaborative effort from your institutions and what uh, what uh, possible use of infrastructure facilities uh, that being said is that uh, uh, there are services and uh, Europe and research infrastructures and institutions are building services all around Europe that you can use. So if you can pinpoint um, uh, even at uh, submission time and you can name them, that shows the evaluator that you know you know your business about open science and research data management. 
Last but not least, intellectual property rights, you need to touch upon them, you know, because data has, uh, uh, has rights, you know, even if it's open, you know, what kind of license uh, you are, we, we are giving to it. Uh, and then um, also there is a section on, on, on intellectual property rights uh, of uh, the consortium agreement, and you can have an indicator here how you will be tackling this uh, in general. Now, uh, again, when writing a proposal is that, yes, it's not, it's not necessary to submit a DMP, but it's necessary to say in your proposal that you will create, you will develop a DMP, a data management plan. Okay, so you need to have a distinct task in this. You can put it in the project management, you can put it in the exploitation, you can put it in your package on, on data management, it's up to you, but it has to be uh, unique and, uh, and, uh, and say, for example, what tools you will be, um, what tools you will be using, that would be a good indicator. And then it has to be a deliverable, an official deliverable by month six. And in most projects, two to three year projects, it may be revisited, uh, it should be revisited, not may, I'm sorry, at the end of the project. For longer projects, when we talk about you know three and a half to four year projects, please do consider that you need to update and revisit at the middle of the project because uh, that's when you know in the beginning is uh, you have um, you have ideas, but then as you go along, you, know, you have more concrete uh, concrete uh, uh, knowledge of where you are heading. And uh, having said that, is that, uh, and uh, we will present at the end of the session, is that uh, these, uh, these uh, data management tools, you know, are slowly becoming, data management plan tools are slowly becoming data management service tools, uh, which uh, will, you know, uh, if, if you use them, they're going to help you to have, you know, a, a central point and an overview of all of the data uh, being, uh, being uh, shared among partners in the world. And if your um, project is data intensive, you know, uh, consider to have an allocated, a dedicated work uh, package or a task on data management. And that, this is where you could put the data management plan. But uh, uh, data management uh, is not just about planning. It's also about, you know, curating, publishing, sharing, all of these things, collecting, cleaning. And, you know, for, for you, you should consider to have that in, in bigger projects that have uh, data management. Next slide. So uh, other aspects eligible in the budget, okay, because open science is not just uh, 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 publications and data. We don't have it here, but you should consider about research software. If your project is, is, is also um, uh, uh, developing or using research software that may, you know, that uh, would be useful to accompany the publications or the data, uh, apart from the research data management plan, consider having a software management plan, which is, you know, what software you will be uh, creating, what are the quality curation methods that you will be using, what repositories like GitHub, uh, how you will be sharing, and uh, and how you want to exploit, for example. So, so this is one big thing that is emerging, you know, and, and the more we, uh, the more we, uh, uh, think about it, you know, the better we are. Uh, other than that is that uh, you, we need to think about open science is in uh, the science communication and outreach and engagement of civils, uh, or civil society and users, policy makers and citizens. This is important uh, because uh, this is, you know, the essence of, uh, of open science to share with the world. So you need to think about, you know, all of this data curation costs, uh, uh, article processing charges, and this is uh, this is something that you need to think in your budget and you know uh, somehow in the other costs. Next slide. Just writing tips. I will not go over it because I think I've gone uh, I've gone uh, through you know over it. But uh, what we see in many proposals is uh, people uh, you know trying to explain what fair and what is open is. We know that you know the evaluators have gone through this uh, you know through this um, training and they know what they you know what it is. So what they are expecting for you is to see 
how you will be implementing fair data. Don't explain fair data. You know, explain how you will go about it very concretely. Uh, do your research ahead of time. Say what repositories you will be using. You know what uh, interoperability metadata standards you will be using. All of that, and just write it. You know so that uh, the person who reads the proposal knows that again that you know that uh, you are uh, you, you know your your stuff. Next slide. Now special cases ERC. Okay. In ERC, uh, there is no explicit evaluation or requirements to describe open science practices, but if included, you know, it, it will have a positive, uh, a positive assessment. Okay, uh, ERC projects do not have scientific work packages or deliverables, but not, they now require a research data management work package with a plan, as you know, as uh, as, uh, as 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 we explained uh, before. There is this ERC DMP template, and I believe that they have uh, a hotline or a help desk. But we could also uh, we could also support you in that. Next is Marie Curie programs. So in Marie Curie, we know that the underlying principles are open science, responsible research and innovation. Uh, the work criteria will consider the soundness of the methodology, okay? Uh, we know that Marie Curie is about mobility, it's about postdocs, and it's about, uh, it's about uh, people, uh, early careers. So what would be important to consider while you are having training activities on the topic of this uh, of the um, of the of the of the theme of your uh, proposal uh, it would be good to have training activities on uh, open science on innovation and entrepreneurship so you know open science we mean we mean rdm and this is where you know uh, if you're writing a Marie Curie uh, uh, project uh, open air we would be happy to work with you because we have um, we have done it a lot in the past, and what we see is that it's very it's very valuable uh, at the beginning when you uh, gather your postdocs. That you know one of the first training sessions uh, could be in Zoom or it could be in one of the schools that uh, you may um, you may uh, consider uh, having is open science and research data management and research software management and how to reach out to citizens. These are the things that, uh, that um, uh, should be considered. So consider having you know, flyers, brochures, uh, or a dedicated space in your project, or you know, invite experts like OpenAir to, to, to have uh, some of these, uh, uh, um, some of these uh, webinars, or even as we are, you know, as the community is progressing, in uh, courses, uh, and I can say for, for open air, but I know that there are many other um, uh, courses out there. Uh, we will be putting out courses for all of these topics uh, in our open Plato uh, Moodle system. So uh, we could work together in order to have, you know, like a kind of a good come. Next slide. So overall tips is, you know, uh, design an open science strategy, okay? It's not, you know, strategy and then include specific provisions, okay? Uh, in the, in the, in the, um, in the proposal, but also in the consortium agreement about where publications and data will be deposited. And what is uh, very important is to, uh, to have roles and responsibilities because uh, in large consortia, when uh, they start and we haven't taken these things into account, then you know it falls on the shoulder of somebody who has not taken budget for it and they see it as a burden so think of these things uh, well in advance uh, allocate uh, uh, a good uh, a good uh, amount of of uh, of, uh, of budget and effort in order for somebody to do it responsibly and trust us is that what we know is that because Many projects continue, you know, to the next project or to different consortia or within national uh, consortia. Uh, what you are doing in this, uh, you know, uh, what, what, what all the actions that we are doing in every projects they pay off because you know next time we are ready to continue the research through another grant. Um, things are there and they are ready to be assessed and they are ready to be used. Okay. Um, 
Okay, uh, I think you know this is uh, this is uh, this is what I wanted to say. And now, if we can uh, go on uh, for requirements for publication. So this is where, when you have your project, okay, when you, your proposal is successful and you have your project and you are, uh, you know, what do you need to do? Okay, so there are some terms here that you know even that I am in open science and open access for so many years. You know, they are. Um, buzzwords that uh, people use and researchers you know i'm not sure they they care about so this is the author uh, manuscripts or the version of record uh, we will uh, yeah we do have a, a diagram after that uh, so what it's uh, what it uh, what it they mean but what we need to distinguish here is be between peer reviewed publications and other type of publications uh, for peer-reviewed publications, uh, because again, you know, still we care about the excellence, and our peers are there to to uh, uh, to to uh, to, our, to make sure that you know whatever is out there is uh, is is good. For peer-reviewed uh, publications, okay, so the manuscript uh, we need to have uh, in a trusted repository. Uh, I cannot stress that uh, you know uh, I will probably stress it more times, but. Uh, the key things that we need to remember here is immediate open access. We need to think about open licenses, okay? And then we need uh, to, uh, and then we need to, uh, to think about, you know, uh, uh, author rights. Those are the three things that, uh, if I had to explain to somebody, would come to mind. So, immediate open access. How can you do it? You know, you find an open access uh, publication a conference, whatever, that they promise, that they say, you know, uh, it's immediate. Uh, and what does immediate mean? Immediate means that, you know, you may have to pay money. So this is gold open access. Or uh, it could be an institutional uh, open access, a diamond open access, we call it, uh, an institutional uh, journal, uh, smaller scale, for example, you know, perhaps in social sciences and humanities, that you know you publish there, and these these people promise you with or without money that everything you know everything should be available uh, immediately. Okay, no embargo period. Then uh, what you need to do at the same time is make sure that you know you retain the rights okay uh we will go over it uh, it explains it better in the next diagram and you have an open license um uh preferably a creative common okay uh, uh and i'm not sure if it's uh, preferably it should be a creative common buy okay uh, then what you need to do is uh, on the mandate is the information about research output or tools or instruments is uh, uh, validate the publication and they are linked to this publication. So if you go to the publisher, they will be asking you where is the data, um, uh, where is the data linked to this publication? You know, please deposit here and there. And it would be nice if you know through your data management plan you have already done this. Uh, what is also important is that you need to add the acronym code of the projects. I think it's in one of the articles, you know, uh, and we will put it here, how to cite the European Commission Horizon Project and uh, uh, the acronym and the contract number within, okay? So this is important. Uh, of course, you know, this publication may come from uh, from uh, from co-funded uh, grants so you need to list all of them what is important is to say you know to 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 to, to know is that even if you do it in an open access publisher or a diamond open access within your institution you need to at the same time deposit in a, a trusted repository, self-archiving. This is a must. There are many reasons why we need to do it, okay? Uh, it's gonna take me a long time to go over it, but, uh, you know, we need we need you to do that. So think about, you know, institutional repositories, preprints, I will go over them, but uh, they, they are a must. Next one. So author, accepted manuscript versus version of record. So, you know, you have your draft, okay? You submit to uh, to uh, to a publisher, okay? And what would be good there is, oops, I'm sorry. Um, 
Okay, what would be good there, uh, and this is a common practice in many communities, is when you submit to a publishing platform or a publisher or a conference, you submit to a preprint server. For example, Archive, BioArchive, there are uh, global preprint servers at uh, at uh, you know at the disposal of everyone to, to go. This is this is very you know this is very um, this is a good practice because first of all you know you ER mark your publication so you know you say what I'm doing you put it out in the open people are looking and in, uh, indexes like Open Air you know and uh, Google Scholar they go through the, through this preprint server so your uh, your manuscript becomes readily available. Then you know you go through this cycle of peer reviewing a revision with uh, with a conference or a publishing platform or journal, and then somebody says, "Okay, you know we accepted your publication, so congratulations. This is what is the author accepted manuscript, okay, or post print. So this post print, you know, you could uh, you could also update in your preprint server or in your institutional uh, your institutional." Uh, uh, repository, and then you know the publisher uh, uh, takes this accepted manuscript with all the with all the changes, and they format it and they put it nicely in their own format. This is when they are publishing, and this is where what is a version of record. So the essence of the content between the AAM and the, the version of record is the same. It's just that, you know, the the, the, how, the the look and feel and the aesthetics that change, you know, okay? So this is important to know. So for repositories and uh, preprints and uh, postprints are what you must do. So you do it in preprint and submission just because you want to make it visible. You make you want to make it your own, but make sure that you uh, update with the uh, author accepted manuscript uh, when it's time to be published. And I think uh, you would be uh, good and uh, uh, have um, you know to 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 check all your lists uh, with this. Next, uh, next, um, next slide. Now, trusted repositories. Okay, so for publication, because we're going to be, say, trusted uh, uh, repositories for, uh, for research data. First and, and foremost is that, you know, trust your institutional repository. This is the first you should consider because how we are trying to build this uh, in Europe and around the world, this infrastructure is by trusting our institutions, our research performing organizations. They're putting a lot of effort, a lot of investment in their institutional repository. It's the job of open air. It's the job of the European Commission or the infrastructure to make sure that these repositories are up to standards, but you should trust it. Okay. Then, as I said, is that, you know, uh, because uh, you, you, you can put it there because perhaps you do have also a mandate from your institution. Okay. So think about it. Uh, then, you know, because you want to be more visible, you know, you could think about the preprint servers or you can think about, you know, uh, more, uh, you know, self-archiving, uh, publishing um, uh, platforms like EuroPMC if you are in the health area. Or you can think general purpose uh, repositories, especially if your institution doesn't have a repository, Zenodo. Uh, that uh, and Lars is going to be uh, talking about it because why? Because it's global, because it's a very good uh, platform to share and it provides uh, visibility plus some other perks that uh, Lars is going to be talking about. But in the end, you know, what you should be looking into, you know, even if your institutional repository is good, you know, but, you know, you know, maybe it's not up to date because it's not running, you know, the latest, uh, the latest um, uh, uh, software or the latest uh, uh, functionalities. And, uh, you know, I know it's recorded, but feel free to, um, to make your complaints in your institutions or libraries if, you know, they're not uh, updating into, into the, the latest. And not, you know, uh, and I think you know, that could be a leverage. It's because, it's not because libraries do not want to update to the latest one, it's because uh, there is, a, um, there is a, a lack of funding, you know, in libraries in order for them, in some libraries, not in all, in, for, for some of them to be able to, to follow the latest trends uh, uh, and in an ever-changing um, ever um, uh, 
uh, landscape. So feel free to complain in a very nice and polite way. And hopefully the libraries will gather and collect all of these, uh, you know, uh, evidence uh, in order to use it as a leverage to update their, uh, to upgrade their uh, repositories. So uh, still, what you should be looking for is uh, provisions to place to secure the accuracy, integrity, authenticity, and access of contents. Okay. So for example, if I put it there, is it going to be lost? Is it going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, annotated or, you know, hacked by others? So things like that. But I think, you know, your institution uh, or these big uh, uh, servers and general purpose repositories like Synodo, I think they are already taking care of that. The use of PIDs and PIDs, not just, you know, not just, um, uh, not just uh, the PID of the article, but also PIDs like, you know, uh, PIDs, uh, does it have ORCID IDs, you know, for researchers? It's very crucial because, because the, the way this vast landscape is, is shaping with uh, the research and innovation ecosystem, we rely on the PIDs to make things connected. And connection, as we all know, you know, being connected is one of the highest priorities that, you know, in research. And then uh, what we need is that, you know, we need these, uh, these, uh, these uh, repository to be able to be connected to European and global um, uh, services, for example, like with OpenAir and the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, PID is a persistent identifier. So every, you know, like a DOI, okay? DOI or ORCID are PIDs, persistent identifiers. Once you give this persistent identifier, it stays with the record forever. Okay, and it describes the record. Uh, so this machine actionable and standardized and detailed metadata, uh, including provenance and licensing, uh, licensing are very important to share with the world. You know, when you want uh, somebody to look into uh, semantic uh, scholar, to open air, to Google scholar, to uh, chat GBT, to whatever, you know, you, you, you hope that your article uh, will, um, find its way in, you know, for discoverability. Uh, good metadata is of crucial, you know, is, is very crucial, okay? So think about, you know, uh, repositories that are compatible with open air guidelines. And, you know, for example, you can ask your institution provider if they are, and if they're not, because the open air guidelines are global and uh, are adopted in the European Open Science Cloud, you know, uh, again, you know, politely complain. Next slide. Specificities. Okay. Uh, publication fees, article processing, charging. Okay. So this is, you know, they can go from 300 to, you know, uh, a few thousand euros. Okay. In very high, uh, highly prestigious uh, um, uh, uh, journals. Uh, are reimbursable if the venue from Horizon Europe is full access. Okay. If the venue, like you know, it's a it's 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 a it's a it's a it's an open access journal, okay, then very reimbursable. And again, uh, please, when you're writing the proposal, make sure that you know you do a back on the envelope calculations of how many articles in which venues, and make sure that you know it's either uh, in a budget within the project manager or the dissemination uh, manager or that you make sure that each partner you know takes responsibility of their own um, of their own uh, publication so there are no restrictions on where to publish okay okay so you can publish in closed journals okay uh, as long as you know you provide immediate open access uh, with no embargo in a repository also there are journals uh, closed journals that uh, they allow you to, uh, to pay a fee for your article only to be open. This is, we call them hybrid journals. And what you should know is that Horizon Europe uh, does not cover um, costs, uh, open access publishing costs in, 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 in hybrid journals. Why is this? Because uh, the commission as a, for, a front runner in open science uh, with this uh, mandate, they're trying very, you know, very hard uh, to put some uh, order into the publishing business. Uh, CC BY, NC, and BY, ND. So NC is uh, non-commercial and ND, I'm not sure what it is. 
license allowed for long text formats like monographs, a chapter in an edited book is not eligible for for this uh, for this cause. So those are those are um, uh, the the usual uh, the, you know those are the specificities. But again, uh, think about think about the cost. Who bears the cost? So think about them when you're writing the the proposal, uh, and also make sure that uh, that you know that if you claim something on a closed journal and you have paid for it is that the reviewer and the auditor may come and say, no, I'm sorry, this is not an eligible cost, okay? Then again, uh, as I said, I would stress it again and again, self-archiving is a must. Wherever you're publishing, open access, closed access, whatever uh, publishing venue you want to, uh, uh, to publish, uh, the self-archiving is a must. So you need to have, you know, uh, a version of your work on a trusted repository, as we said. And then uh, uh, the, the, the small lines here is that you need, you know, the only exception here is, you've, is if you publish in the EC service, Open Research Europe, that we will talk in a bit, okay? Uh, then licensing, uh, please pay attention to this, uh, to this thing here that the author accepted manuscript and the version of record might be available under different licensing, okay? Uh, but the final one, the version of record, the published one, uh, retaining your rights, okay? This is this is this is this is very important. And I know that in many countries, and there will be um, a study out in many countries by law, you need to, authors of scientific publications they need to retain uh, the, the rights. This is not known to many. Uh, and they don't follow it, but this is uh, something that you should um, uh, that you should uh, you should pay attention. So you have rights as an author. So uh, just to you know to close, it's not about where you make it available in open access. Uh, it's about wh where you make it available in open access, not where you publish. Okay, so you can choose where you publish. We you know everyone you know they respect your rights. You know you know best where your um, your, um, uh, you know, uh, the best visibility, the best uh, impact for the scientific, uh, the, the scientific impact or the, you know, impact beyond that. But what is important is that, you know, is you need to make it available in, in open access, okay? And um, next slide. Okay, uh, uh, rights retention strategy, okay? For subscription-based, okay, so for closed journals or hybrid journals, which are, you know, journals that are closed, but they allow authors to pay, you don't always have to pay for open access. Uh, what you need to think about is that in Europe, and I think all around the world, but especially in Europe, uh, member states uh, and uh, institutions uh, have made deals with uh, publishers. Uh, we call them transformative agreements. And they have agreed with publishers that if the, uh, it's not the first author, is the corresponding author comes from, from, from this uh, particular uh, institution that has this transformative agreement with said publisher, then uh, it's by default open access. So please, before you pay something for, from Horizon, um, oops, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Okay, before you pay something from Horizon Euro budget, make sure that you have talked to your library or your research or management office to see if your um, if your institution has made such agreements with this uh, with this. And then and then you know, or you can look with your co-authors and think about you know who could be the corresponding author. It's not the first author; it's the corresponding author. Okay, so this is this is this is key because then you're saving money. Uh, then to assert the ownership, the author as the intellectual creator uh, applies the CC BY license to the AAM. And then delivering publication services does not entitle publishers to ownership of the AAM, which remains the intellectual property of the author. Okay, Publication services should be paid for but not with ownership of the AAM. You know, this should be in bold letters. And uh, we have these... Uh, these, uh, um, these uh, 
uh, link here. Uh, if, uh, if, oops, I'm sorry, but my my watch is uh, speaking. You know, it has a life of its own in it's speaking. So this is this is uh, how you know uh, uh, the retention uh, uh, rights retention strategy. And I think uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, okay, uh, you can go. We have some uh, checking tools that you can go here. And see, you know how uh, how you can check all of this. So there are tools, or if you don't know, you know how to use the tools, please, you know you can use the Open Air Health Desk for any question that you have. Next slide. Now another option is the Open Research Europe. You know we're not going to go very, you know, uh, very um, uh, fast over it. This is a European Commission. Oh, a service offered a service offered by the European Commission. So it's oeuropa.ecu. So it's a it's a very you know it's a very um, uh, official service of the European Commission. Okay, uh, for that allows it's a publishing platform. It's not a journal. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, is that uh, what does it do? It has, you know, a diamond, what we call a diamond open access. Diamond open access means that somebody is paying a funder or an institution for uh, for an open access uh, journal or publishing platform, and the author is not paying. Okay, uh, no cost to authors or readers. Okay, it's an optional service. It doesn't mean that because you were the recipient of a Horizon Europe. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, project that you have to uh, that you have to uh, 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 publish there, uh, but think about you know it's available during and after the end of the project because especially for young researchers who are doing their research uh, and they don't have uh, the money to pay for the for the for the for the uh, gold uh, APCs that the publishers are asking. This is a very good venue. So the way, uh, so it's everything, you know, it's automatic compliance with the open access requirements. And then why, as I said before, there was the exception um, uh, that uh, uh, that you don't have to deposit in uh, self-archive is because once you uh, publish through this platform, there is uh, a sync, an automated deposit to Zenodo. So you're done with, you know, your, your requirements. It has a uh, high scientific standards and policies, a scientific advisory board with a uh, key, you know, with um, very high level uh, uh, scientists from different, uh, from different uh, uh, fields. And uh, it follows the policies and the latest and the greatest policies and guidelines for open science. Next uh, slide is, if you see that is, uh, it is, uh, this Open Research Europe, it's between a preprint and a publishing platform. So what you can do is you can submit your article. You know, it doesn't have to be an article. It can be more than an article. It can be other types of, of uh, research outcomes. Uh, so it's deposited all, already in Zenodo, okay? And then you can invite, you know, uh, open peer review and user commenting, okay? So it's 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 a very open platform uh, that allows that allows you know uh, that allows uh, the community to gather around uh, papers. Then if it's past the peer review. Uh, it's sent to index and uh, to indexers and repositories. For example, Scopus, PubMed, OpenAir, OpenAlex, and all of its, the 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 you know the key players that uh, you are uh, reading uh, on the right. So think about Open Research Europe as a preprint that can potentially be you know um, uh, peer reviewed. Okay. Uh, next one, uh, and I stop here because I think you know I think I took uh, longer than. Uh, than um, they had um, uh, uh, signed me for, but you know, there was too much to say, and I hope that uh, things were clear, but I will stay here for the end, uh, for the end part and also for the questions. Yes, thank you, Natalia, so much for this thought-provoking presentation of yours. Uh, so we have some questions here in the Q&A, a special place for you to put them. So let's go to the first one by Barbara Temple. Uh, is it a plus point general practice to allocate money in the budget from having a data, stu and data steward? This is the very first question. 
it, I will answer it also on, on online, but yes, it is. That's why yeah. I said, you know, responsibilities, okay? So if your institution, for example, or if your research lab has a data steward, you know, please, you know, name them. You know, don't be afraid to give names with experience. Uh, and it it is a plus. It is a plus. Okay. Uh, and, you know, many, many don't have data stewards. Maybe, you know, may, many have, you know, especially for long tail of science, you can uh, name a data librarian or you can name a service at your library or a service at your institution. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, like, you know, we have this kind of office that does this and this and this, two lines. Uh, yes, it is a plus. Perfect. And one more question uh, from... Jorge Parola, um, when uh, reporting publications in running project and in case that the partner did not deposit the paper in a repository, can we use the open access publication link as a repository link? In, in the reporting, you can do it. You can do it, but I think uh, uh, in the reporting of the commission, in the participant portal, I think, okay, can we use the open access publication link? Uh, no, uh, the open access publication link is the is the open access to the to 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 the to the journal. If they are asking for a repository link, you need to put the repository. And in many cases, as I will explain in the end, is that. Um, what you do is that uh, you retrieve uh, the data from open air. So if you have it in a repository, then you know it automatically appears there, all the IDs. Perfect, thank you so much for covering this. We have no open uh, questions yet. So let's move forward to our expert, Maya Dolinar, for requirements for research data. Thank you very much and welcome everyone from my side as well. I will present to you an overview of what kind of requirements for research data are in the Horizon Europe. So in terms of mandates, uh, the most important thing is that you are obliged to manage all digital research data that you can generate within your project responsibly, meaning that everything is in line with the FAIR principles. Uh, I'm going to explain what FAIR principles are a bit later on in the slides in a more detail, but for now what is important to know is that FAIR principles are four, and these are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, and uh, there are three uh, like requirements that you should minimally do in terms of research data. First one is that you have to prepare a data management plan, as we have already discussed in some detail. Uh, by month six, of course, it needs to be prepared, and this ma this uh, data management plan, of course, you will update during the project and also before the end of the project. Um, so, and the, the second requirement is that you must deposit at least the metadata, but also hopefully also the data itself as soon as possible after it has been produced or, or after it has the, gone through any quality controls. And all this has to be deposited in a trusted repository and uh, that provides access to it. So we're going to see what uh, the requirements for a trusted repository are uh, a bit later on as well. Uh, data doesn't need to be open, but you need needs to deposit it, and you need to deposit it in a trust to trusted uh, repository, uh, and follow this rule of opening it as open as possible and as close as necessary. And the third requirement is that you have to also provide information for the same repository of any other research outputs and or any other tools or instruments that are needed to reuse or validate the data. So this kind this could be for for, for example. Uh, protocols, software, then uh, any uh, executable notebooks, and so on. If you go forward, please. Next, yeah. Uh, so I said, uh, as I said before, data can be closed if that is the nature of your data, but uh, uh, but uh, try to consider it opening it at least in a version uh, that is probably this is perhaps anonymized if that is possible. But it, it can be closed if necessary. But on the other hand, the metadata must be uh, must, must be uh, open uh, in a public domain with a public domain license such as the CC0. 
Uh, so for those who, who don't know what metadata is, metadata is basically any data that explains uh, the content of what the data is. So for example, this would be uh, the authors of the data, the title, uh, any persistent identifiers that link to the data, basically all, all what describes the data, even some methodological um, information and so on. All, all this is what we call metadata. And you also have to share the data under either a CC BY license, but prefer but preferably under the CC0 license. Again, I will explain the future slides what the difference between both of the licenses is. Uh, and as, as I said before, a strong emphasis is also on providing uh, all detailed information about research outputs to validate and reuse the data. So any accompanying documentation as well as a software code and and uh, maybe executable notebooks and so on. Uh, if you go forward, please. Uh, so it is very clear from the documentation from the European Commission that intellectual property rights are really important for the European Commission. So there is a valid justification for not opening the data. Uh, for example, commercially valuable data, uh, for instance, uh, does not, of course, have to be open. You, you can make it closed so that you can exploit basically the results. Uh, and if there are any data privacy, data protection issues, uh, you know, if you have, for example, some personal sensitive data, personal data under GDPR, then obviously you wouldn't be opening that. But in this case, you might consider creating a version of a data set that would involve anonymized, uh, anonymized data set. For example, we're going to talk, uh, talk about later on one of the tools that OpenAir is offering that uh, allows you to anonymize data sets as well. So you should consider also uh, providing your data sets in different versions uh, the, uh, and restrict the ones who have which have sensitive data and create additional data set versions so that could be used also uh, with the CC BY or a CC0 license everywhere and be openly shared and exploitable. Uh, so uh, next slide please. Uh, there are a few exceptions in terms of opening data. Uh, so if it needs to be open, for example, for validation, you might need to open it to specific individuals. Uh, and then it, there is also a case of public emergency. Uh, this was created uh, and added to the policy because of the COVID-19 emergency that we all experienced. And this can be triggered by the European Commission, and you would need to then provide immediate open access, basically, to, to not just uh, the publication itself, but also to the data. Again, there might be some conflict with uh, intellectual or property rights here, um, and this is something that you would then need to discuss directly with your project officer in terms to, to kind of resolve these issues. Uh, if you go forward, please. Uh, so now let's see a, a few definitions that we were using throughout the uh, presentation that it's, so that things are more clear to you. Uh, so trusted repositories uh, are basically uh, infrastructures that provide reliable, and the point here is long-term access to a digital resources such as data and publications. Uh, and usually these repositories go through assessment or certification processes to basically gar guarantee that certain quality criteria and certain best practices from the field are met. Um, Horizon Europe uh, uh, considers three types of trusted repositories. The first ones are certified repositories. And uh, these ones you can see from the websites of the re uh, repositories where they're all clearly state uh, or have like a badge that they are uh, certified either with a core trust seal or others. And then the second uh, type of trusted repository that the Horizon Europe mentions are the main specific repositories. These are the ones that are commonly used and are kind of widely endorsed by the research community uh, that's relevant to your research project. So if you're unsure which kind of these are, just China checked within your research community where people are usually uh, going to uh, and where where this kind of data is uh, usually deposited. And then the third type is general purpose repositories or even institutional repositories. Here's a node that falls into place. Uh, that pay, they, they, they don't have official certification, but they can present essential characteristics of a trusted repositories, for example, uh, security provisions, then um, services that create machine actionable data, they, they oblige to long-term preservation of data, which is the most important thing, and so on. So... Um, 
For research data, you can see here, there is a specific website where you can basically uh, have a look at different repositories and it's called refreedata.org. And you can also filter through uh, uh, for the uh, what which repositories in the list are trusted repositories or have certifications. Uh, or you can just go to Open Air Explore as well. And then you can also have a list of all the possible different repositories available and just select the ones who which is more the most appropriate for your own uh, research project depending on what you're doing so if you can go forward uh, so in terms of licenses for publication it has to be a creative commons attribution license as we said uh, so a cc by license and for data it is preferably uh, a CC0 license or a CC BY license. So Creative Commons is basically, this is an actual license. It's a legal binding license um, that really uh, gives you um, information and it avoids confusion basically on what you can do or cannot do with the data or the publication. So under CC BY, for example, you have to basically say who the authors were from, of the source you're using and which context. So for instance, this slide, you can see here in the corner, in the right corner below, you can basically see that the, the that we are sharing these slides under the CC BY license, meaning that you can easily reuse them as you want. You can modify the content as long as you credit the authors who created the slides. So its origin. CC zero is a bit different, and we'll not go really go into the details. So, but this is the preferred sharing for data because uh, it allows then easy machine actionable API connections. Uh, but CC0 also means basically that you can share it without having to attribute the authors and it's really high, quite similar to, similar to a public domain type of a license. Uh, if you go forward now. Uh, so we already mentioned the data management plan. This itself is a really important document and uh, we really cannot cover all the details and specificities in this webinar. It's usually a topic on its own. So I advise you to look at some webinars uh, for data management as well or some, some documentation. However, just to simply explain it, if you haven't heard about it before, this is basically a formal, what we call a living document uh, that really specifies how you'll be handling research data both during and after the research project. So basically how you're gonna share it with partners, uh, with your partners, the data after the project, what you're going to do with the data, um, how you're gonna then share it with the rest of the world. And the issue with data management plan is that there is basically no absolute right or wrong answers uh, as long as you justify it in the document why you made this decision. It is just that you have to really prove to the project officer that you know what you're doing with the project. And it and as it was mentioned before, um, all of these data management and sharing activities uh, need to be costed into your research proposal in terms of the time and resources that you need. It's really good to the good practice that you do that in the planning uh, early stages, because all of these costs can be claimed as eligible costs under any Horizon Europe grant during the duration of the project. So, and there are some um, uh, cost uh, estimating tool for RDM activities. I will share a link after I finish my part of the presentation that we also created that could help you basically kind of budget this uh, RDM activities for your project. If you go forward, please. So Horizon Europe really emphasizes that all the management of research data and other outputs uh, coming from uh, data are in accordance with the FAIR principles, uh, which means that you have to make uh, data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So if you make data available via a trusted repository, already you're, you have done a lot of the work uh, uh, in increasing your fairness because all of these trusted repositories also abide by this principle. So if you choose a repository that is trusted, you, you are well on the way to really following uh, data management under the in line with the FAIR principles. So in terms of the FAIR principles, again, this could be a webinar on its own. So anyone who is more interested should, should go <laughs> into more study into the FAIR principles. 
Uh, we're going to just quickly go through them. Uh, basically, there are a few different concepts that you need to take into consideration. For instance, uh, your, your data needs to have what you call a persistent identifier, like a DOI. So for instance, if you deposit on Zenodo, uh, it, will, it will give you this DOI that will always result in a landing page. Uh, and basically this persistent identifier will ensure that uh, there are never any broken links when people will try to access your uh, data. Uh, and then data and publications need to be deposited in a trusted repository. They need to be well documented so that the person who comes after you will understand what you have been doing. And it's good to have a reading file as well to explain all this. It needs to have a clear license um, and use also um, open source or at least well used file formats if possible to avoid uh, this proprietary statistical programs or any issues then uh, in the future of accessing these files because uh, we all know that file formats become obsolete for time. Uh, so all these kind of aspects are what we call the FAIR principles, but uh, again, this is just a quick overview, and if you're not familiar with them, I really advise you to look a bit into more detail to get familiar with them and also to be able to, to fill this part of the data management plan. Uh, so uh, you need to also provide a data availability statement in your article, even if there is no data associated to your article. So this should be added to the end of your article prior to submission. And what is important here is that you should never refer your readers or reviewers in the statement to contact you directly in order to obtain the data, since this is not uh, in line with the FAIR principle of accessibility. You should always have a, a repository that's, uh, that uh, shares your data. Uh, if you move forward, please. So the European Commission has really put a lot of uh, big focus on open science in Horizon Europe calls. Uh, we had mentioned all the mandatory requirements for data and publication. However, however, there are also a lot of different types of open science practices that, could, that you could basically take on additionally in your project. Uh, so open science is basically an umbrella term that involves many different practices and concepts. Um, I'm not going to go into much details here, but you'll have the slides and you'll be able to go through them to see what kind of practices you could additionally take on. The point is that uh, uh, the, uh, while the mandatory open science practices are required, so your score will be basically lower if you don't include them, the recommended open science practices do not have a negative impact. They will only have a positive impact if you include them. So next slide. So here is a list of open science practices together with their mandatory or recommended positions in the calls. Uh, so if you include citizen science, for instance, that will be a positive evaluation. But if you do decide not to include it, it will not have a negative impact. Um, so if you go forward, please. Uh, so one of the this kind of practices is pre-registration. This is basically where you publish a plan of a study. So the research question, hypothesis, research design, how you're planning on analyzing the data before you even start doing the research. Uh, so this kind of practice would be highly recommended adding to your grant proposal to show that you basically are really trying to make your research as open and transparent as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, preprints, preprints is another uh, open science practice, and this is when you publish a version of your publication before peer review. This, this we see, we saw even before. Um, so I will not go into much details. You can read it on the slide and see some of the examples here in the picture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another practice is public engagement. So this can be done in many different ways, as you can see here. So if you're going to do public engagement, really think about demonstrating that in your grant proposal. So what you're planning on doing, and this will for sure improve your overall score. And the last practice, if you smooth the slide, is civil is citizen science. So this means basically directly involving the citizens in your research projects. This is also something that will definitely bring you additional points in the grant proposal since the European Commission really favors such efforts. So I would highly recommend you try to, to see these uh, uh, additional practices and try to include them as much as possible in your research projects. So with that, I conclude, then I give my word to Lars, who's going to show you a bit more about some tools that you okay. can use. Thank you. Maya. Thank you so, so much, Maya. Um, uh, so before uh, giving the floor to Lars Nielsen, we have an open question uh, from Loretta Rogers, and it has to do of how to handle process data, VS raw data in terms of 
uh, license attribution. We currently recommend it CC by you or CC0 for process data in a public domain license for all data. Is there a recommendations by HC? I don't know if uh, it's possible to be answered. Um, I mean, this all, all this refers to the raw data that you share, not the processed one. The processed one are all, are already um, kind of in a in a way analyzed, so it's a part of analysis. So all these requirements and all this sharing is what I have been talking about. It concerns raw data. So and also the recommendation from the Horizon Europe is for raw data. So we need to share that part and what you're talking about where you already process the data, that means that you're already doing something with the data and you're you're changing it to uh, to answer your either research questions or whatever you're doing. So that that would mean another um, you could, of course, also publish that and, and, and add it to the to the um, public to the data publication. However, this um, this is the addition addition to the raw data. That, yeah. Perfect. So let's move forward. Thank you so much, our next expert, uh, to give us some insights about useful tools for projects. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So as you've heard, uh, there's a lot of uh, rules to comply with. There's also a lot of practices you can do. And uh, you've seen the Open Research Europe platform, there's journals, there's repositories you, you have to deposit them to. So I think um, the DMP that was mentioned before is one of your key tools to figure out where to actually put all these things because I don't think there's a clear answer. It all depends on your situation and you should really evaluate it. So um, then uh, you've seen that Sonodo can do a lot of all these things. And I wanna present a new solution that we have on, on Sonodo that have been working on and launched here in March and is still working on, on the, for, for EU projects, okay? So basically on Sonodo, um, we now have a new community called the EU Open Research Repository. So it's managed by us at Sonodo on behalf of the commission. Uh, and it's a place where you can basically share anything like you can on Sonodo related to an EU project. Okay, So it really gathers everything on Sonodo uh, uh, that is uh, funded by the European Commission. And right now there's about 100,000 records uh, from about 11,000 different grants. I think one of the things is that um, uh, in projects, of course, you have the journals, you have the software, you have, the, you have some of these high-level uh, scientific products, but there's also a lot of other products you produce in a, in a, in a project like uh, dissemination plans, the, uh, the DMP, the, the, there's a lot of technical specifications, hopefully, and things like that, that you also have to share in presentations, okay? And so notice is really one of these places where you can share it. So. With this, um, uh, next slide, please. So with the EU Research Repository, this is a place where you can put any kind of research output. Uh, and the difference between the Open Research Europe platform is that this is a curated, it's not a peer reviewed. So it's you who's in control of what you publish in there. This is really a repository, okay? Whereas with the Open Research Europe platform, which is also a, a product from the European Commission, it's really about publishing articles and having them uh, peer reviewed. Uh, next slide. So with this new EU research repository, what you can do is you can go and create an EU project community. And this was a practice that was already uh, at Sonodo for a long time. There's about 2,700 communities at Sonodo uh, that represents an EU project already today. Uh, so now for these types of communities, it's a place where you can share all these outputs for you, from your project that might not fit in other places. And for instance, at CERN, we often have uh, we also have our own institutional repository. But there, if 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 a del EU deliverables is produced by another set of people from other institutions, then it doesn't really fit into the institutional repository. So some kind can be difficult to find this common place to collaborate uh, when you have an EU project. So this is. Uh, a Sonodo community is really this place where you can bring the different um, different partners together and collaborate across uh, across those partners. Uh, then Sonodo ensures that you can um, oh uh, just uh, stay on the previous slide. Thank you. So then uh, these these communities they also integrated uh, with old mayors with the participant portal as you also heard right. And then the special thing about these communities is that we treat them a bit differently now. So they still look like a normal community, but uh, they 
when you put something into the into your project community, they automatically goes into this high level EU open research repository and becomes available there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, as an example of how you can collaborate, this is some of the new features that we launched in, in October last year, is that when you have one of these communities, right, then you can, first of all, you can log in with uh, the OpenAI AI, so that means you can log in with your institutional accounts now, okay? Then for community, you can now also manage uh, who is part of it. So that means that you can have multiple different people from different institutions having different roles. So some people, they can be allowed to see uh, if you have any restricted content or barcode content, they can see that. You can have curators who is able to then accept or decline things into the community, edit all the metadata of all the, uh, all the research output that is in the community and accept new things into it. Um, and then you can have people that can manage the team and things like that. So that's various different options for how you can uh, have multiple people from the project uh, contribute. And then one of the new features that was also launched is that you can now review uh, any submissions. So you can also just tell uh, your, your project partners that here's a community, please upload it into there. Then there will be a review to make sure that, uh, that before it's published, then you can uh, uh, check that things are okay, that it's the right files, that, uh, that you have completed all the, 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 the required metadata. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as previously said, right, so Zenodo supports you in complying with some of all these uh, open science requirements that are with this, like linking with the grant, linking with the, peer, the persistent identifier. So when you add an author, we automatically auto complete from the ORCID database. For affiliations, we make sure we auto complete from the research organization registry. So you get all these PADs, it's an, it's an easy way. And then uh, what is coming in the... Um, in spring next year is that we'll basically also have these automated compliance checks so that when you deposit into one of these EU project communities, you will easily see um, if all the requirements uh, from the Horizon Euro grant agreement is complied with. So, you know, is it an open, if it's a journal article, is it an open access, did you provide the journal information and all some of the nitty gritty details that you really don't want to try to uh, explain to everybody, but just have a check is it, is it all there? So this is something that's coming. There's also some, some fair evaluation tools that will be integrated in here uh, uh, in this nodal workflow that helps you just have a tiny sanity check of what is being deposited, does it comply with actually what, what is required? Uh, next slide. So if you're starting an EU project, and would like one of these communities, it's as simple as going to this URL that you see uh, below. Okay, and there's a small questionnaire where you have to provide what is your project. If you already created a community, then you can link that existing community. And if not, we'll, we'll create a new one for it. And then we will uh, verify that the person who requested it is actually affiliated with uh, the, one of the partner institutions and that it is, it is for one of the funded projects. Okay, so you can create it for both Horizon Europe. That includes MCSA and uh, ESC. It's also Horizon 2020 and Euro at some Okay, um, and that's uh, basically it. Then you just request it and you can get one of these. Then I'm handing over to Natalia. Okay, so, um, okay, I will just go very briefly over the tools, you know, that we provide, Open Air provides, but uh, please, uh, you know, check with your institutions, you know, check with your local research infrastructure nodes to see, you know, what other services that they provide. Uh, just to make, you know, your, your, your life easier when you're running the project. So Open Air Explore is the Open Air Graph which you know, we collect uh, all publications, uh, metadata publications and PDFs, uh, uh, records uh, from uh, research data, uh, software, we link them together to organizations, to grants, to people. So based on that, we have this Open Air Explore uh, where you have a 360 view of, of um, of uh, of um, you know of, of of what's going on in the domain, but also what's going on in the project. Uh, if you click on next, because there is some animation here, uh, what you can do using Open Air Explorer, uh, okay, here one is that uh, you if you go and identify your project, okay, and you make sure that uh, you follow the publications and uh, and uh, research data. 
um, depositing in the right places. We collect this data, and then what you can do as as as, as a thing is that, and this is what also the commission does in Cordis, is that you can uh, copy this uh, little JavaScript uh, on your website so everything appears automatically. So what we're trying to do is what we're trying to tell the community is once you deposit something in a place, it should be automatically be visible, you know, across the commission, across the indexers, but across your projects and across everything. So this is this is what you can do. Then uh, what you can also do is you can, uh, next slide, uh, next, uh, next, uh, so, no push next. So, oops, uh, we pushed uh, one or two, okay, one. Uh, you can find in your project space here, please uh, press next, uh, statistics, metrics, and graph for projects. So, for example, you know, this is a project that we were involved and uh, they are, uh, you know, how many publications uh, we, we went over the year. And then, uh, uh, Stefania, if you can, one next. Um, uh, also, um, research project by data source where most of them were. So it gives you an idea for monitoring, you know, uh, even, you know, for, for the coordination part. Then what you can do, what is nice about open air is that we assign, you know, um, to publications and then we aggregate to projects. Uh, we tag with sustainable development calls and fields of uh, research. And this is very, this is very, um, this is very uh, important. Why? Because most of the funders and our institutions they want to really evaluate, uh, you know, how how their uh, efforts uh, are uh, are uh, fulfilling the sustainable goals, and uh, and it's it's very important to think of, you know, as part of your project, you know, that you know the the outcomes are part of the whole. Uh, infrastructure on on research and innovation. Okay, then uh, I, I don't have any more um, uh, screenshots. But if, oops, no, no, please back. Okay, if you go back, is that you know you can claim you know you can come to um, to Open Air and you can claim publications to your Orchid you know automatically to your Orchid profile. So you can we can have a brochure you know and 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 a checklist for all the projects of what they can do with uh, services like that. Okay, now next. I'm <laughs> sorry, Stephanie. Okay, now Amnesia. We offer Amnesia. This is actually a tool you know. Um, operated by Athena Research Center here in Greece. It's an anonymization tool. It's one of the uh, well-known ones used especially for long tail of science. So what you need to think about is before, you know, if you want something, if you want to publish something, you know, a questionnaire, uh, some, some data that has privacy issues, is you need to anonymize the data if you want to share publicly, okay? But even if you want to share with special, you know, with, uh, with um, uh, bilateral agreements, still, you know, you should publish because of the GDPR. So please go and use, you know, see Amnesia. It's amnesia.openair.eu and see how you can uh, use it. And most, most, most importantly, it's not a tool that you can use on the open air side. We have it as, as, a, as, as a test bed. Uh, you should, you could download and you could contact us and to embed into your researcher workflows because all the data, you know, once it goes out into the network, it's not, uh, uh, there are privacy issues and security issues. So please talk to us about it, but there are tools like that. And then uh, finally, one of the key um, uh, services that uh, Open Air is promoting is Argos. Argos is uh, our version of the data management tool. So it's free and open source for everyone, for researchers to come and use. We offer paid um, subscriptions uh, for institutions to uh, deploy it locally or to deploy uh, something on the cloud uh, of open air. This is coming now in September. Uh, so institutions uh, actually uh, configure it and, uh, and uh, to their own needs. Because again, uh, data management plans is that uh, are uh, are being developed by um, uh, by PIs by principal investigators having in mind so many mandates from their funders you know if there is a co-funding you know uh, if there is an institutional mandate if there is a national mandate so um, so these templates allow allow 
um, a holistic view and um, take the burden out of researchers in order to make a uh, you know to make their um, work uh, easy. What is nice about Argos is that it's uh, it's linked to the Open Air Explorer and the Open Air Graph. So if you go into these into this, is that uh, expect a lot of a lot of automated pre-filling uh, template, you know, um, uh, things that support that support researchers and make it easy for them, you know, as easy as it can get. Because uh, writing a data management plan is is not, you know, is not uh, easy. And then uh, at the end, everything is published. You no, know, you can be published and preserved in Zenodo, and it can have uh, versions and histories. And everything, so you can, uh, so it can become a living document. But you can always uh, return back in time and see, you know, what is uh, happening. So it's it's a full blown service. And uh, if you will see in the next slide, uh, there are community calls, monthly community calls. We um, we advise you, you know, to have your people or some of your people or your data stewards or your data librarians to come and join uh, these calls because uh, knowing and working with tools such as Argos is uh, becoming all the more relevant in, um, in, uh, in uh, now, no, not in the years to come, but uh, already now. Now, next uh, slide is reporting and monitoring. I will go very, very, uh, very, um, uh, quickly, because uh, we are uh, out of time. So, reporting and monitoring is that this is one part of the uh, one part of the you know where the commission uh, requires and you will be assessed. So, every reporting period, you know, when you have your evaluations, your evaluators and reviewers uh, will go into this. Uh, partici uh, I don't know if it's participant portal anymore. We used to call it participant portal, but let's say it's the European Commission portal. And they will try to, you know, to get all of the information out of there. This is, you know, the place where um, the consortium uh, talks with the commission and uh, with the reviewers. Okay, so there is structured reporting, uh, and there is also free text reporting or encourage for open uh, uh, science practices. Um, if you um, go next slide is that, for example, um, there is uh, the continuous reporting, you know, if you have people, if you have, you know, good project management uh, would require, um, if you can say, let's say every quarter, every six months, but you update things, why? Uh, because uh, when you're doing it a reporting and um, uh, reviewing time, then we know how things are. You know, we are all uh, we we have all been there, and you're trying to find you know in, in rather you know in also bigger consortia, you're trying to gather and collect you know everything, and you're trying you know um, even even if you have a DMP, if you have somebody to follow this DMP, uh, what we see is that usually is you know a month before the reviewing or before the submission of the thing is that uh, we're all running around to to, to, to see how uh, to make things in place what we're trying to say is that you know if you are very good in using repositories for publications for for data for software for everything and if you you know if you kindly use the open air services then some of this because uh, our services are interconnected with this uh, participant portal uh, they will magically find, you know, uh, uh, things there. So you don't have to do much. You, you would have to go over and, uh, and uh, you know, say yes, 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 or this is a small part is missing. So good practices and good, uh, you know, good uh, guides to all the participants and just follow through quarterly or, uh, you know, every uh, uh, every six months is, is very relevant here. So for example, here in the publications, uh, next slide, <clears throat> In this uh, reporting, you can you can press uh, you know you can press some buttons. I, I I cannot really see them now, but I know how it works. You can say you know uh, retrieve data from from open air. So we have uh, uh, APIs through open air. You know open air talks to Zenodo, open air talks to publishers to other repositories, and they have open air as the the place where this uh, this 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 uh, this um, system and platform talks, okay, the, 
exchanges information, not talks, exchanges information. And, and you can retrieve, you can say, you know, retrieve uh, uh, publications uh, from open air. You get to retrieve everything. We try to fill in uh, exactly the template of the commission. So, you know, what is uh, in a repository, what is uh, open access, you know. What we don't have here is how much uh, the, the, the uh, immediate open access and gold open access publications have cost it. And this is something that uh, we would like to put, you know, we would like to have the commission have as a field. I'm not sure if they have put it in, but again, you know, this is this is this is how it goes. And uh, once you retrieve the, the the list from the open air, if you have done a good job with your consortium, then that means is that you don't have to do much. If you haven't done, you know. I wouldn't say if you haven't done a good job now, uh, because I want to sound positive, but you know, if you have done your work is that everything should appear here. And uh, the only thing that you do is just monitor and see, okay? Uh, that is very, very important, you know, to change, you know, into the project management. And maybe you want to put that in your project management packet is that, you know, continuous monitor is something that, you know, you value and you will be pay attention to that with, you know, quarterly or internal uh, uh, every two year, um, these kinds of processes. Uh, you should know that when the commission, you know, if 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 open air doesn't have one of these publications and you put it in, the commission exchange exchanges information with the open air graph and somehow it appears in the graph. So the idea for us is that even if you haven't done, you know, the due diligence, some of your partners in doing that, if if you are putting of if they are putting it there, then you know it appears in the graph and you can have it, you know, uh, it appears in, in in other places. Next one, I think it's the same for publications. Okay. Oh. Okay, I will not go that. This is a self-explanatory form. We've discussed this, so you know, let's do it in the data sets. There is, uh, there is also, you know, this is about the the, the, the button on the data sets, and it's a, it's kind of the same process again. And all of this, you know, appears in the graph. The graph is used in bibliometrics and scientometrics in many universities by the commission by other funders. But this, whatever you're putting here, appears also in Cordis database. So, so, so having this interconnected system, I mean, it's it's very important, and I really don't know how to stress that more and more without getting boring. Okay, so this is the same uh, or a similar procedure. And then, last but not least, I think it's the last slide, uh, is that results versus other results. So there is the other results tab here. And what we need to uh, acknowledge, as I said at the beginning, for example, publications, they are the peer-reviewed publications, but there are other types of publications. You know, I had a policy document, I had this and that and that. So this, you know, this should be reported also in the you know in the in, in the commission portal but also in repositories you know the, the more you have you know the the, the 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 best practices for open science should span you know should cover all of the research outcomes of your project okay then you know also consider software and again i would like to caution because software research software is emerging to become as a first uh, class citizen in Horizon Europe and then in other funders. It's very important now. Workflows, protocols, prototypes, anything that you can imagine as one good result that you know needs to be cited. Think about citation and needs to be, you know, that it's not only only the peer-reviewed thing, is you should report, okay? And you not only you should report, you should make it known to the world uh, through open science practices. Uh, and I think we are done. We, you know, I took a long, uh, uh, I, I have to apologize to my colleagues because I took a long time in, in the first section and then I could see that we were rushing, uh, but then uh, we're learning. Thank you so, so much for these fascinating subjects and detailed presentations. And of course, you'll have, uh, um, first of all, let's say, uh, a, a very big uh, grateful uh, thanks to all of our attendees and their patients, and of course their contribution to this webinar. 
And of course, please play, feel free, don't hesitate to contact us to give you further insights and guidance. I have put you my email in the chat. And of course, you can find us uh, through Open Air's uh, website. Um, so I don't see any open questions, but let's give a couple of minutes in case there is something left to be said. Okay, I don't see anything open. Okay, thank you so, so much. Please keep in mind that uh, this kind of webinar, it will be of course, published in Zenodo and uh, to our uh, YouTube channels in open air. And thank you, thank you so, so much for attending. Have a very great day. Bye-bye to all of you.